Okay, hi everybody, welcome back. It's good to see you all here. Um, it's been another busy week of deep learning. Um, lots of cool things going on, and uh, like last week, I wanted to highlight a few really interesting articles that some of uh, some of you folks have have written. Um, uh, Vitaly uh, wrote um, one of the best uh, articles I've seen for a while, I think, um, actually talking about uh, differential learning rates and stochastic gradient descent with restarts. Um, uh, be sure to check it out um, if you can, because what he's done, I feel like he's done a great job of kind of positioning in a place that you can get a lot out of it, you know, regardless of your background. But for those who want to go further, he's also got links to like the academic papers it came from, and uh, kind of graphs of showing examples of all of uh, all of the things he's talking about. Um, and I think it's a it's a particularly nicely done article. So a good kind of role model for technical communication. Um, one of the things I've liked about you know seeing people post these uh, post these articles during the week is the discussion on the forums have also been like really great. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of people helping out, like explaining things, you know, which you know maybe there's parts of the post bit where people have said actually that's not quite how it works, and people have learnt new things that way. Uh, people have come up with new ideas as a result uh, as well. Um, these discussions uh, of uh, stochastic gradient descent with restarts and cyclical learning rates has been a few of them actually. Uh, Anand uh, Sahar has written another great post um, uh, talking about a similar uh, similar topic. And why it works so well, and again, lots of great uh, pictures and references to um, papers, and uh, most importantly, perhaps code uh, showing how it actually works. Um, uh, Mark Hoffman uh, covered the same topic at uh, kind of a nice introductory level. I think really, really kind of clear intuition. Um, Manikanta talked specifically about differential learning rates uh, and why it's interesting. Uh, and again, providing some nice context to people not familiar with transfer learning, you know, going right back to saying like, well, what is transfer learning? Why is that interesting? And given that, why could differential learning rates be helpful? Uh, and then uh, one thing I particularly liked about Arjun's uh, article was that he talked not just about the technology that we're looking at, but also talked about some of the uh, implications, particularly from a commercial point of view. Uh, so thinking about like, Based on some of the things we've learned about so far, what are some of the implications that that has, you know, in real life? Um, and lots of background, lots of pictures, um, and then discussing some of the, yeah, some of the implications. Um, so there's been lots of great stuff online, and uh, thanks to everybody for all the great work that you've been doing. Um, as we talked about last week, if you're Kind of vaguely wondering about writing something, but you're feeling a bit intimidated about it because you've never really written a technical post before. Just jump in, you know. Um, it's uh, it's 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 a really uh, welcoming and encouraging group, I think, to to work with. Um, so we're going to have a kind of an interesting uh, lesson today, which is we're going to cover. Um, uh, a whole lot of different applications. So we've we've spent quite a lot of time on computer vision, and today we're going to try, if we can, to get through three totally different areas: uh, structured learning. Uh, so looking at kind of how you look at. Uh, um, so we're going to start out looking at structured learning uh, or structured data learning, by which I mean um, building models uh, on top of things that look more like database tables. Uh, so kind of columns of different types of data, they might be financial or geographical or whatever. Um, we're going to look at using deep learning uh, for language, natural language processing, uh, and we're going to look at using deep learning for recommendation systems. And so we're going to cover these at a very high level, and the focus will be on here is how to use the software to do it, more than here is what's going on behind the scenes. And then the next three lessons um, will be digging into the details of what's been going on behind the scenes and also coming back to looking at a lot of the details of computer vision that we have kind of skipped over so far. So the focus today is really on like, how do you actually do these applications? And we'll kind of talk briefly about some of the concepts involved. 
Um, before we do, I did want to talk about one key uh, new concept, um, which is uh, dropout. And you might have seen dropout mentioned a bunch of times already, and got the got the impression that this is something important, and indeed it is. Um, so to look at dropout, I'm going to look at the uh, the dog breeds um, uh, current Kaggle competition that's going on. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and, ahead and I've created a um, pre-trained network as per usual, uh, and I've passed in pre-compute equals true, and so that's going to um, pre-compute. Uh, the activations that come out of the last convolutional layer. Remember, an activation is just a number. Right? It's a number, just to remind you. Um, an activation, like here is one activation, it's a number. And specifically, the activations are calculated based on some weights, also called parameters, uh, that make up uh, kernels or filters, and they get applied to the previous layer's activations, which could well be the inputs, or they could themselves be the results of other calculations. Okay, so when we say activation, keep remembering we're talking about a number that's being calculated. So we pre-compute some activations, and then what we do is we put on top of that uh, a bunch of additional, initially randomly generated, uh, fully connected layers. So we're just going to do some matrix multiplications on top of these, just like in our Excel worksheet at the very end. We had this matrix that we just did a matrix multiplication by. Um, so what you can actually do is if you uh, just type the name of your learner object, you can actually see what's in it. You can see the layers in it. So when I was previously been skipping over a little bit about oh we add a few layers to the end, these are actually the layers that we add. Um, we're going to do batch norm in the last lesson, so don't worry about that for now. A linear layer simply means a matrix multiply. Okay, so this is a matrix which has 1,024 rows and 512 columns, and so in other words, it's going to take in 1,024 activations and spit out 512 activations. Uh, then we have a ReLU, which remember is just replace the negatives with zero. Uh, we'll skip over the batch norm. We'll come back to dropout. Uh, then we have a second linear layer that takes those 512 activations from the previous linear layer. And puts them through a new matrix multiply, 512 by 120, spits out a new 120 activations, and then finally put that through softmax. And for those of you that don't remember softmax, we looked at that last year, uh, last week. Um, it's this idea that we basically just uh, take the pre the activation, let's say for dog, um, go e to the power of that, and then divide that into the sum of e to the power of all the activations. So that was the thing that adds up to one, all of them add up to one, and each one individually is between zero and one. Okay, so um, that's that's what we added on top, and that's the thing when we have pre-compute equals true, that's the thing we train. So I wanted to talk about what this dropout is and what this P is, because it's a really important thing that we get to choose. So a dropout layer with P equals 0 0.5 literally does this. We go over to our spreadsheet, and let's pick any layer with some activations, and let's say, okay, I'm going to apply dropout with a p of 0 0.5 to con 2. And what that means is I go through, and with a 50% chance, I pick a cell, right? pick an activation, so I pick like half of them randomly, and I delete them. Okay? Uh, that's, that's what dropout is, right? So, it's, uh, so the p equals 0.5 means What's the probability of deleting that cell? Right. So um, when I delete those cells, if you have a look, like look at the output, it doesn't actually change by very much at all. Just a little bit, particularly because remember it's going through a max pooling layer, right? So it's only going to change it at all if it was actually the maximum in that group of four. Um, and furthermore, it's just one piece of you know, if it's going into a convolution rather than into a um, max pool, it's just one piece of that that filter. Um, so interestingly, um, the idea of like randomly throwing away half of the activations in a layer uh, has a really interesting uh, result. Um, and one important thing to mention is each mini batch we throw away a different random half of activations in that layer. And so what it means is. 
it, it forces it to not overfit, right? In other words, if there's some particular activation that's really learnt just that exact um, that exact dog or that exact cat, right? Then when that gets dropped out, the whole thing now isn't going to work as well. It's not going to recognize that image, right? So it has to, in order for this to work, it has to try and find a representation that that actually continues to work even as random half of the activations get thrown away every time, right? So it's a it's it's. I guess about four years old now, three or four years old, and it's been um, absolutely critical in making modern deep learning work. And the reason why is it really just about solved the problem of generalization for us. Before Dropout came along, uh, if you tried to train a model with lots of parameters and you were overfitting, and you already tried all the data augmentation you could, and you already had as much data as you could. You there were some other things you could try, but to a large degree you were kind of stuck. Right? And so then um, uh, Jeffrey Hinton and his colleagues came up with this this dropout idea that was loosely inspired by uh, the way the brain works, um, and also loosely inspired by Jeffrey Hinton's experience in bank telecues, apparently. Um, and uh, yeah, somehow they came up with this amazing idea of like, hey, let's. Let's try throwing things away at random. And so, as you can imagine, if your p was like 0.01, then you're throwing away 1% of your activations for that layer at random. It's not going to randomly change things up very much at all. So it's not really going to protect you from overfitting much at all. On the other hand, if your p was 0.99, then that would be like Going through the whole thing and throwing away nearly everything, right? And that would be very hard for it to overfit. So that would be great for generalization, but it's also going to kill your accuracy. So there's this kind of playoff between high p-values generalize well, but will decrease your training accuracy, and low p-values will generalize less well, but will give you a less good training accuracy. So for those of you that have been wondering, why is it that particularly early in training are my validation losses better than my training losses? Right? Which seems otherwise really surprising. Hopefully some of you have been wondering why that is. Because on a data set that it never gets to see, you wouldn't expect the losses to ever be much better. And the reason why is because when we look at the validation set, we turn off dropout. Right? So in other words, when you're doing inference, when you're trying to say, is this a cat or is this a dog, we certainly don't want to be including random dropout there, right? We want to be using the best model we can. Okay, So that's why early in training, in particular, um, we actually see that our validation uh, accuracy and loss tends to be better uh, if we're using dropout. Okay, So yes, Yannet, let me give you... Uh, do you have to do anything to accommodate for the fact that you are throwing away some? Um... That's a great question. So um, we don't, but PyTorch does. So PyTorch behind the scenes does two things. If you say p equals 0.5, it throws away half of the activations, um, but it also um, doubles uh, all the activations that are already there. So on average, the kind of the, the average activation doesn't change, uh, which is pretty. Pretty neat trick. Um, so yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Basically, it's it's done for you. So if we say so, you can pass in p's. This is the this is the p value for all of the added layers. To say uh, with fast AI, what dropout do you want on each of the layers in these these added layers? It won't change the dropout in the pre-trained network. Like the hope is that that's already been. Pre-trained with some appropriate level of dropout, we don't change it. But on these layers that we add, you can say how much. And so you can see here, I said p's equals 0.5. So my first dropout has 0.5. My second dropout has 0.5. Right? And remember, coming to the input of this um, was the output of the last convolutional layer of the pre-trained network. And we go away, and we actually throw away half of that before we even start. Go through our linear layer, throw away the negatives. 
throw away half of the result of that, go through another linear layer, and then pass that to our softmax. Um, for minor numerical precision re reasons, um, it turns out to be better to take the log of the softmax than the softmax directly, and that's why you'll have noticed that when you actually get predictions out of our models, you always have to go np.x of the predictions. But again, the details as to why aren't important. So if we want to try removing dropout, we could go p's equals zero, right? And you'll see where else before we started with a 0.76 accuracy in the first epoch, now we've got a 0.8 accuracy in the first epoch, right? So by not doing dropout, our first epoch worked better. Not surprisingly, because we're not throwing anything away. But by the third epoch, here we had 84.8, and here we have 84.1. So it started out better and ended up worse. So even after three epochs, you can already see we're massively overfitting, right? We've got 0.3 loss on the train uh, and 0.5 loss on the validation. Okay? Um, and so if you look now, you can see in the resulting model, there's no drop out at all. So if the p is zero, we don't even add it to the model. Um, another thing to mention is you might have noticed that what we've been doing is we've been adding two linear layers right, in our additional layers. You don't have to do that, by the way. There's actually a parameter called extra fully connected layers that you can basically pass a list of how long do you want Or how big do you want each of the additional fully connected layers to be? And so by default, uh, well, you need to have at least one, right? Because you need something that takes the output of the convolutional layer, which in this case is a size 1024, and turns it into the number of classes you have. Cats versus dogs would be two, dog breeds would be 120, uh, planet satellite 17, whatever. Right? So you always need one linear layer, at least. Um, and you can't pick how big that is, that's defined by your problem. Um, but you can choose what the other size is, or if it happens at all. So if we were to pass in an empty list, then now we're saying don't add any additional linear layers, just the one that we have to have. right? So here if we've got p's equals zero, extra fully connected layers is empty, this is like the minimum possible um, kind of top model we can put on top. and Again, like if we do that, um, uh, you can see above, we actually end up with, in this case, a, a reasonably good result because we're not training it for very long, and this particular pre-trained network is very well suited to this particular problem. Yes, you know. So, Jeremy, what kind of P should we be using by default? So the one that's there um, by default um, for the first layer um, is 0.25, and for the second layer is 0.5. Um, that seems to work pretty well for most things, right? So, like, it's it's it you you don't necessarily need to change it at all. Um, basically, if you find it's overfitting, just start bumping it up. So, try first of all setting it to 0.5. That'll set them both to 0.5. If it's still overfitting a lot, try 0.7. Like, you can you can narrow down. Um, and like there's not that many numbers to change, right? And if you're underfitting, um, then you can try making it lower. Um, it's unlikely you would need to make it much lower, uh, because like even in these dogs versus cats situations, um, you know, we don't seem to have to make it lower. So it's, it's more likely you'll be increasing it to like 0.6 or 0.7. Um, but you can fiddle around. I, I find these, the ones that are there by default seem to work pretty well most of the time. Uh, so one place I, I actually did increase this um, was in the dog breeds one, I did set it, them both to 0.5 uh, when I used a, um, a bigger model. So like ResNet 34 has less parameters, so it doesn't overfit as much. But then when I started bumping, pumping it up to like a ResNet 50, which has a lot more parameters, I noticed it started overfitting, so then I also increased my dropout. So as you use like bigger models, you'll often need to add more dropout. Uh, can you pass that over there, please, you know? Uh, if we set P to 0.5, uh, roughly what percentage? Is it 50%? 50%. Yep. Can you pass that back? Thanks. 
Um, is there a particular way in which you can determine if the data is being overfitted? Uh, yeah. Um, you can see that the, uh, like here, you can see that the training error is a loss is much lower than the validation loss. Um, you can't tell if it's like too overfitted, like zero overfitting is not generally optimal. Like the only way to find that out is remember the only thing you're trying to do is to get this number low, right? The validation loss number low. So in the end, you kind of have to play around with a few different things and see which thing ends up getting the validation loss low. Um, but you'll kind of get a feel over time for your particular problem. What does overfitting? What does too much overfitting look like? Great. So, um, so that's dropout, and we're going to be using that uh, a lot. And remember, it's there by default. Sorry, was there another question? Uh, uh, so I have two questions. Sure. Uh, one is um, so when it says the uh, dropout rate is uh, 0.5. Uh, is, does it like uh, you know uh, delete each cell with a probability of uh, yes. 0.5, or right. does it just pick 50% randomly? I mean, I know both effectively it's and the, not it's the former. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, second question is um, why why does the average activation uh, matter? Well, it, it matters because the um, remember if you look at the uh, Excel spreadsheet that the result <laughs> of this cell, for example. Is equal to um, these nine um, multiplied by each of these nine, right, and added up. So if we deleted half of these, then that would also cause this number to half, which would cause like everything else after that to change. And so if you change what it means, you know, like it, you, then you're changing something that used to say like, oh. Fluffy ears are fluffy if this is greater than 0.6. Now it's only fluffy if it's greater than 0.3. Like you're changing the meaning of everything. So you, the, the goal here is to delete things without changing the meaning. Uh, why are you using a linear activation for one of the earlier activations? Why are we using linear? Yeah, why, why that particular activation? Because um, that's what this set of layers is. So we, we've, we've the, the pre-trained network is, all, is the convolutional network, and that's pre-computed, so we don't see it. Uh, so what that spits out is, is a vector. So the only choice we have is to use linear layers at this point. Okay. Uh, uh, can we have different level of dropout by layer? Yes, absolutely. And how, to, how to do that? Great. So, um, so you can absolutely have different dropout by layer, and that's why this is actually called P's. Um, so you could pass in an array here. So if I went 0, comma, 0.2, for example, and then extra fully connected, I might add 512. Right, then that's going to be 0 dropout before the first of them, and 0.2 dropout before the second of them. Yes, good question. And I must admit, I don't have a great intuition, even after doing this for a few years, for like, when should earlier or later layers have different amounts of dropout. Um, it's still something I kind of play with, and I can't quite find rules of thumb. So if some of you come up with some good rules of thumb, I'd love to hear about them. Um, I think if in doubt, um, you can use the same dropout in every fully connected layer. Um, the other thing you can try is often people only put dropout on the very last linear layer. So that'd be the two things to try. So Jeremy, why do you monitor the log loss, the loss, uh, instead of the accuracy going up? Well, because the loss is the only thing that we can see um, for both the validation set and the training set. So it's nice to be able to compare them. Uh, also, as we'll learn about uh, later, the loss is the thing that we're actually optimizing. Um, so it's it's kind of a little more it's a little easier to monitor that and understand what that means. Uh, can you pass it over there? Uh, so with dropout, we are kind of adding some random noise every iteration, right? Yes. So, uh, so that means that um, we don't do as much learning, right? Or yes. should we? So that's right. So uh, we have to play around with the learning rate, and it doesn't seem to impact the learning rate. Uh, enough that I've ever noticed it. 
I, I would say you're probably right in theory. It might, but not enough that it's ever affected me. Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, this uh, structured data problem. And so to remind you, we were looking at uh, Kaggle's Rossmann competition, which is a German uh, a chain of supermarkets, I believe. Um, and you can find this in Lesson 3 Rossmann. Um, and the main data set is the one where we were looking to say uh, at a particular store, how much did they sell? Okay, and there's a few key pieces of information. One is what was the date? Another was were they open? Uh, did they have a promotion on? Uh, was it a holiday in that state, uh, and was it a holiday a, for school, a state holiday there, or was it a school holiday there? Uh, and then we had some more information about stores, like what for this store, what kind of stuff did they tend to sell, what kind of store are they, how far away are the competition, and so forth. So with a data set like this, there's really two main kinds of column. There's columns that we think of as categorical, they have a number of levels. So the assortment column is categorical, and it has levels such as A, B, and C. Um, where else uh, something like competition distance we would call continuous, it has a number attached to it where differences or ratios even of that number have some kind of meaning. And so we need to deal with these two things quite differently. Okay. So uh, anybody who's done any machine learning of any kind will be familiar with using continuous columns. If you've done any linear regression, for example, you can just like multiply them by parameters, for instance. Um, categorical columns we're going to have to think about a little bit more. Um, we're not going to go through the data cleaning, we're going to assume that that's, uh, and feature engineering, we're going to assume all that's been done. Um, and so basically, uh, at the end of that, we have a list of columns. And the in this case, I didn't do any of the thinking around the feature engineering or data cleaning myself. This is all directly from the third place winners of this competition. Um, and so they came up with uh, all of these different uh, uh, columns that they found useful. Um, and so you'll notice uh, the list here is a list of the things that we're going to treat as categorical variables. Numbers like year, month, and day, um, although we could treat them as continuous, like they, the dif you know, differences between 2000 and 2003 is meaningful, we don't have to, right? And you'll see shortly how, how categorical um, uh, variables are treated. But basically, if we decide to make something a categorical variable, what we're telling our neural net down the track is that for every different level of, say, year, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, you can treat it totally differently. Whereas if we say it's continuous, it's going to have to come up with some kind of like function, some kind of smooth-ish function, right? And so often, even for things like year that actually are continuous, but they don't actually have many distinct levels, it often works better to treat it as categorical. Um, so another good example, day of week, right? So like day of week between naught and six, it's a number and it means something, like the difference between three and five is two days and has meaning. But if you think about like how would sales in a store vary by day of week, it could well be that like, you know, Saturdays and Sundays are over here and Fridays are over here and Wednesdays are over here. Like each day is going to behave kind of qualitatively differently. Right, so by saying this is a categorical variable, uh, as you'll see, we're going to let the, the neural net do that. Right, so this thing where we get where we say which are continuous and which are categorical, to some extent, this is a modeling decision you get to make. Now, if something is coded in your data as like A, B, and C, or you know Jeremy and Yannet, or whatever, you actually you're going to have to call that categorical. Right? There's no way to treat that directly as a continuous variable. On the other hand, if it starts out as a continuous variable, like age or day of week, uh, you get to decide whether you want to treat it as continuous or categorical. Okay? So to summarize, 
If it's categorical in the data, it's going to have to be categorical in the model. If it's continuous in the data, you get to pick whether to make it continuous or categorical in the model. So in this case, again, I just did whatever the third place winners of this competition did. Uh, these were the ones that they decided to use as categorical. These were the ones they decided to use as continuous. And you can see that basically the continuous ones are all of the ones which are actual floating point numbers. Like competition distance actually has a decimal place to it, right? And temperature actually has a decimal place to it. So these would be very hard to make categorical because they have many, many levels, right? Uh, like if, if it's like five digits of floating point, then potentially there will be as many levels as there are um, as there are rows. Right? And uh, by the way, the word we use to say how many levels are in a category, we use the word cardinality. Right? So if you hear me say cardinality, for example, the cardinality of the day of week variable is seven, because there are seven different days of the week. Do you have a heuristic for when to bin continuous variables? Or do you ever bin variables? I don't ever bin continuous variables. Um, um, so yeah, so one thing we could do with like max temperature is group it into uh, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and then call that categorical. Um, interestingly, a paper just came out last week in which uh, a, a, a group of researchers found that sometimes bidding can be helpful. But uh, that literally came out in the last week, and until that time, I haven't seen anything in deep learning saying that. So I haven't, I haven't looked at it myself. Until this week, I would have said it's a, a bad idea. Uh, now I have to think differently. I guess maybe it is sometimes. So if you're using uh, year as a category. What happens when you run the model on a year? It's never seen. So you trained it in two thousand. We'll, we'll, we'll right? get there. Okay. Yeah. Um, the short answer is it'll be treated as um, an unknown category. And so pandas, which is the underlying data frame thing we're using with categories, has a special category called unknown. And if it, if it sees a category it hasn't seen before, it gets treated as unknown. So for our deep learning model, unknown will just be another category. If uh, our data set, uh, training data set doesn't have a category and the uh, test has unknown, how will it treat? It'll just be part of this unknown category. Will it still predict? Uh, it'll predict something, right? Like it'll just have the value zero behind the scenes. And if there's been any unknowns of any kind in the training set, then it will have learned uh, uh, a way to predict unknown. If it hasn't, it's going to have some uh, random vector. And so that's a interesting detail around training that we probably won't talk about in this part of the course, but we can certainly talk about on the forum. Okay, so we've got our categorical and continuous variable lists defined. Um, in this case, there was uh, 800,000 uh, rows, um, so 800,000 dates basically by stores. Um, and so uh, you can now take all of these columns loop through each one and replace it in the data frame with a version where you say take it and change its type to category. Okay? And so that just that's just a pandas thing. So I'm not going to teach you pandas. There's plenty of books, uh, particularly Wes McKinney's books, uh, book on um, Python for data analysis is great. Um, but hopefully it's intuitive as to what's going on even if you haven't seen the specific syntax before. So we're going to turn that column into a categorical column. Uh, and then for the continuous variables, we're going to make them all 32-bit floating point. And for the reason for that is that PyTorch um, uh, expects everything to be 32-bit floating point. Okay. Um, so like some of these include like um, one zero things like uh, uh, I can't see them straight away, but anyway, some of them are, uh, yeah like was there a promo? Was was it a holiday? And so that'll become the floating point values. One and zero instance. Okay, so um, uh, I try to do as much of my work as possible on small data sets. Um, for when I'm working with images, that generally means resizing the images to like 64 by 64 or 128 by 128. Uh, we can't do that with structured data, so instead I tend to take a sample 
so I randomly pick a few rows. Uh, so I start running with a sample, and I can use exactly the same thing that we've seen before for getting a validation set. We can use the same way to get some random random row numbers to use uh, in a random sample. Okay, so this is just a, a bunch of random numbers. Um, and then, okay, so that's going to be a size 150,000 rather than 840,000. Um, and so my data, before I go any further, it basically looks like this. You can see I've got um, some booleans here, I've got some uh, uh, integers here of various different scales, here's my year, 2014, um, and I've got some letters here. So even though I said, um, please call that a pandas category, um, pandas still displays that in the notebook as strings, right? It's just stored in internally differently. So then uh, the fast AI library has a special little function called process data frame and process data frame takes a data frame and you tell it what's my dependent variable right and it does a few different things. The first thing is it pulls out that dependent variable and puts it into a separate variable okay and deletes it from the original data frame. So df now does not have the sales column in where else y just contains the sales column. Um, something else that it does is it does scaling. Um, so neural nets really like to have the input data to all be somewhere around zero with a standard deviation of somewhere around one. Right? So we can always take our data and um, subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation to, to make that happen. Uh, so that's what do scale equals true does. And it actually returns a special object which keeps track of what mean and standard deviation did it use for that normalizing, so you can then do the same thing to the test set later. Um, it also handles missing values. Um, so uh, missing values uh, in categorical variables just become uh, the ID zero, and then all the other categories become one, two, three, four, five for that categorical variable. Um, for continuous variables, it replaces the um, missing value with the median. Uh, and creates a new column uh, that's a boolean and just says is this missing or not. And I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly because we talk about this in detail in the machine learning course. Okay, so if you've got any questions about this part, um, that would be a good place to go. Um, it's nothing deep learning specific there. Um, so you can see afterwards, year 2014, for example, has become year two. Okay, because these categorical variables have all been replaced with. Um, uh, with contiguous integers starting at zero. Right? And the reason for that is later on we're going to be putting them into a matrix, right? and so we wouldn't want the matrix to be 2014 rows long when it could just be two rows long. Okay? So that's the basic idea there. And you'll see that the um, AC, for example, has been replaced in the same way with one and three. Okay, so we now have uh, a data frame which does not contain the dependent variable and where everything is a number. Okay, and so that's the, that's where we need to get to to do deep learning and all of the stage above that, uh, as I said, we talk about in detail in the machine learning course. Nothing deep learning specific about any of it. This is exactly what we throw into our random forests as well. So. Um, uh, another thing we talk about a lot in the machine learning cor course is validation sets. Um, in this case, we need to predict the next two weeks of sales, right? It's not like pick a random set of sales, but we have to pick the next two weeks of sales. That was what the Kaggle competition folks told us to do. Um, and therefore, I'm going to create a validation set, which is the last two weeks of my training set, right? To try and make it as similar to the test set as possible. And um, we just posted actually, Rachel wrote this thing last week. Uh, about creating validation sets. So if you go to fast.ai, you can check that out. We'll put that in the lesson wiki as well. Um, but it, it's basically a summary of a recent machine learning lesson that we did. Um, uh, the videos are available for that as well, and this is kind of a written, a written summary of it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Rachel and I spent a lot of time thinking about kind of, you know, how do you need to think about validation sets and training sets and test sets and so forth? And uh, that's all there. Um, but again, nothing deep learning specific. So let's get straight to the, the deep learning action. 
Okay. So in this uh, particular competition, as always with any competition or any kind of um, machine learning project, you really need to make sure you have a strong understanding of your metric, um, how you're going to be judged here. And in this case, you know, Kaggle makes it easy. They tell us how we're going to be judged. And so we're going to be judged on the roots mean squared percentage error, right? So we're going to say like, oh, you predicted three. Uh, it was actually 3.3. So you were 10% out. And then we're going to average all those percents, right? And remember, I, I warned you that uh, you um, are going to need to make sure you know logarithms really well. Right, and so in this case, from you know, we're basically being saying your prediction divided by the actual the mean of that, right, is the thing that we care about, um, and so we don't have a metric in PyTorch called root mean squared percent error. Um, we could actually easily create it, by the way. Um, if you look at the source code, you'll see like it's you know a line of code. But easier still would be to realize that. Um, that if you have that, right, then you could replace A with like log of A dash and B with like log of B dash, and then you can replace that whole thing with a subtraction. That's just the rule of logs, right? And so uh, if you don't know that rule, then you know make sure you go look it up because it's super helpful. But it means in this case, all we need to do is to uh, take the log of our data, um, which I actually did earlier in this uh, notebook, and when you take the log of the data, getting the root mean squared error will actually get you the root mean squared percent error for free. Okay, um, but then when we want to like print out our root mean squared percent error, we actually have to go e to the power of it again, right? And then we can actually return the percent difference. So that's all that's going on here. It's again not really deep learning specific at all. Um, so here we finally get to the deep learning. All right. So uh, as per usual, like you'll see, everything we look at today looks exactly the same as everything we've looked at so far. Which is first we create a model data object, something that has a validation set, training set, an optional test set built into it. Uh, from that we will get a learner. Uh, we will then optionally call learner dot lr find. We'll then call learner.fit, it'll be all the same parameters and everything that you've seen many times before. Okay, so um, the difference though is obviously we're not going to go um, image classifier data dot from CSV or dot from paths, we need to get some different kind of model data. And so for stuff that is in rows and columns, we use columnar model data. Okay, but this will return an object with basically the same API that you're familiar with. And rather than from paths or from CSV, this is from data frame. Okay, so this gets past a few things. The path here is just used for it to know where should it store, like model files or stuff like that. Right? This is just basically saying where do you want to store anything that you save later. Uh, this is the list of the indexes of the rows that we want to put in the validation set which we created earlier. Here's our data frame. Okay. Um, and then let's have a look. Here's uh, this is where we did the log, right? So I took the the y that came out of procdf, our dependent variable. I logged it, and I call that yl, right? So we tell it when we create our model data, we need to tell it that's our dependent variable. Okay. So so far we've got list of the stuff to go in the validation set, which is what's our independent variables, what's our dependent variables, and then we have to tell it. Which things do we want treated as categorical, right? Because remember, by this time, everything's a number, right? So it, it it could do the whole thing as if it's continuous. It would just be totally meaningless, right? So we need to tell it which things do we want to treat as categories. And so here we just pass in that list of names that we used before. Okay, and then uh, a bunch of the parameters are the same as the ones you're used to. For example, you can set the batch size here. So after we do that, um, we've got a uh, you know a standard model data object with a tra train DL 
attribute, there's a val DL attribute, a train DS attribute, a val DS attribute, it's got a length, it's got all the stuff exactly like it did in all of our um, uh, image-based um, data objects. Okay, so now we need to create the, the model, or create the learner. And so to skip ahead a little bit, um, we're basically going to pass in something that looks pretty familiar. We're going to be passing, saying, from our model, from our model data, create a learner that is suitable for it, um, and we'll basically be passing in a few other bits of information, which will include uh, how much dropout to use at the very start, um, how many um, how many activations to have in each layer, um, how much dropout to use at the at the later layers. Um, but then there's a couple of extra things that we need to learn about, and specifically, it's this thing called embeddings. Um, so this is really the key new concept we have to learn about. All right. So all we're doing basically is we're going to take our let's forget about categorical variables for a moment and just think about the continuous variables. Right? For our continuous variables, all we're going to do is we're going to grab them all. Okay, so for our continuous variables, we're basically going to say like, okay, here's a big list of all of our continuous variables, like the minimum temperature, and the maximum temperature, and the distance to the nearest competitor, and so forth, right? And so here's just a bunch of floating point numbers. And so basically what the neural net's going to do is it's going to take that, that 1D array, or, or vector, or to be very DL-like, um, rank 1 tensor, uh, all means the same thing. Okay, so we're going to take our rank 1 tensor, and let's put it through a matrix multiplication. So let's say this has got like, I don't know, 20 continuous variables, and then we can put it through a matrix which must have 20 rows, that's how matrix multiplication works, and then we can decide how many columns we want, right? So maybe we decided 100, right? And so that matrix multiplication is going to spit out a new length 100 rank 1 tensor. Okay? That's that's what that's what a linear that's what a matrix product does and that's the definition of a linear layer in deep learning. Okay? And so then the next thing we do is we can put that through a ReLU, right? Which means we throw away the negatives. Okay? And now we can put that through another matrix product. Okay, so this is going to have to have 100 rows by definition. Uh, and we can have as many columns as we like. And so let's say maybe this was um, the last layer. So the next thing we're trying to do is to predict sales. Um, so there's just one value we're trying to predict for sales. So we could put it through a matrix product that just had one column, and that's going to spit out a single number, right? So that's like, that's kind of like a, a, a one layer uh, neural net, if you like. Now in practice, you know, we wouldn't make it one layer, um, so we'd actually have like, um, you know, maybe we'd have 50 here, and so then that gives us a 50 long vector, and then uh, maybe we then put that into our final 50 by 1, and that spits out a single number. And one reason I wanted to change that there was to point out, you know, ReLU, you would never put ReLU in the last layer. Like, you'd never want to throw away the negatives, because that the softmax... Uh, let's go back to the softmax. The softmax needs negatives in it, because it's the negatives that are the things that allow it to create low probabilities. That's minor detail, but it's useful to remember. Okay, so basically, um, so basically, a simple view of a um, fully connected neural net is something that takes in as an input uh, a rank one tensor. Um, it spits it. Th through a linear layer, an activation layer, another linear layer, a softmax, and that's the output. Okay? Um, and so we could obviously decide to add more linear layers, 
uh, we could decide maybe to add dropout. Right. So these are some of the decisions that we we get to make. Right. But we there's there's not that much we can do. Right. There's not much really crazy architecture stuff to do. So when we come back to um, image models later in the course, we're going to learn about all the weird things that go on in like ResNets and Inception networks and blah blah blah. Um, but in these fully connected networks, they're really pretty simple. They're just interspersed linear layers, that is matrix products, and activation functions like ReLU and a softmax at the end. Um, uh, and if it's not classification, which actually ours is not classification, in this case we're trying to predict sales, there isn't even a softmax. Right? We don't want it to be between zero and one. Okay? So we can just throw away the last activation altogether. Uh, if we have time, we can talk about a slight trick we can do there, but um, for now we can think of it that way. So um, that was all assuming that everything was continuous. Right? But what about categorical? Right? So we've got like um, a day of week. Right? And we're going to treat it as categorical, right? So it's like Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, oh, that should be six. Friday. Okay. How do we feed that in? Because I, I want to find a way of getting that in so that we still end up with a rank one tensor of floats. And so the trick is this: we create a new little matrix of with seven rows. And as many columns as we choose, right? So let's pick four, right? So here's our seven rows and four columns, right? And basically, what we do is um, let's add our categorical variables to the end. So let's say the first row was Sunday, right? Then what we do is we do a lookup into this matrix, and we say, oh, here's Sunday. We do a lookup into here, and we grab this row. And so this matrix we basically fill with floating point numbers. So we're going to end up grabbing a little subset of four floating point numbers. It's Sunday's particular four floating point numbers. And so that way we convert Sunday into a rank one tensor of four floating point numbers. And initially those four numbers are random. Right? And in fact, this whole thing, we initially start out random. Okay, um, but then we're going to put that through our neural net. Right. So we basically then take those four numbers and we we remove Sunday, and instead we add our four numbers on here. Right. So we've turned our categorical thing into a floating point vector. Right. And so now we can just put that through our neural net. Just like before, and at the very end we find out the loss, and then we can figure out which direction is down, and do gradient descent in that direction, and eventually that'll find its way back to this little list of four numbers, and it'll say, okay, those random numbers weren't very good. This one needs to go up a bit. That one needs to go up a bit. That one needs to go down a bit. That one needs to go up a bit, and so we'll actually update our original those four numbers in that matrix. And we'll do this again and again and again, and so this this matrix will stop looking random, and it will start looking more and more like like the exact four numbers that happen to work best for Sunday, the exact four numbers that happen to work best for Friday, and so forth. And so, in other words, this matrix is just another bunch of weights in our neural net, right? And so, matrices of this type are called embedding matrices. So an embedding matrix is something where we start out with an integer between zero and the maximum number of levels of that category. We literally index into a matrix to find a particular row. So if it was the level was one, we take the first row, we grab that row, and we append it to all of our continuous variables. And so we now have a new Vector of continuous variables, and when we can do the same thing for let's say zip code, right? So we could like have an embedding matrix. Let's say there are five thousand zip codes. It would be five thousand rows long. 
as wide as we decide, maybe it's 50 wide, and so we'd say, okay, here's uh, 94003, uh, that zip code is index number 4 in our matrix, so we'd go down and we'd find the fourth row, we'd grab those 50 numbers and append those onto our big vector. And then everything after that is just the same. We just put it through our linear layer, ReLU, linear layer, whatever. Okay. What are those four numbers represent? That's a great question. And we'll learn more about that, about that when we look at collaborative filtering. For now, they represent no more or no less than any other parameter in our neural net. You know, they're just, they're just parameters that we're learning that happen to end up giving us a good loss. Um, we will discover later that these particular parameters often, however, are human interpretable and quite, can be quite interesting. But that's a side effect of them. It's not fundamental. They're just four random numbers for now that we're that we're learning, or sets of four random numbers. Uh, <clears throat> Do you have a good heuristic for the dimensionality of the embedding matrix? So why four here? I sure do. But wait, there's more. So, what I first of all did was I made a little list of every categorical variable and its cardinality. Okay, so there they all are. So there's a hundred, there's a thousand plus different stores, apparently, in Rossman's network. Uh, there are eight days of the week. That's because there are seven days of the week plus one leftover for unknown. Even if there were no missing values. In the original data, I always still set aside one just in case there's a missing or an unknown or something different in the test set. Again, four years, but there's actually only three plus room for an unknown and so forth. Right. So what I do, my rule of thumb is this: take the cardinality of the variable, divide it by two, but don't make it bigger than fifty. Okay. So. These are my embedding matrices. So my store matrix, so the the, the has to have a thousand one hundred and sixteen rows because I need to look up right to find his store number three, and then it's going to return back a rank one tensor of length fifty. Day of week, it's going to look up into which one of the eight and return the the thing of length four. So would you typically build an embedding matrix for each categorical feature? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I've done here. So I've, I've, I've said uh, for C in categorical variables, see how many categories there are, and then for each of those things, create one of these. And then this is called embedding sizes, and then you may have noticed that that's actually the first thing that we pass to get learner, and so that tells it for every categorical variable that's the embedding matrix to use for that variable. So uh, just behind you, there's. Yes, sure. I have a question. So, so besides um, uh, random initialization, are there other ways to actually initialize embedding? Um, yes and no. There's two ways. One is random. The other is pre-trained, and We'll probably talk about pre-train more later in the course, but the basic idea though is if somebody else at Rossman had already trained a neural net, um, just like you, you would use a pre-trained net from ImageNet to look at pictures of cats and dogs, if somebody else has pre-trained a network to predict cheese sales in Rossman, you may as well start with their embedding matrix of stores to predict liquor sales in Rossman. Uh, and this is what happens, for example, at, um, at Pinterest uh, and Instacart. They both use this technique. Instacart uses it for routing their shoppers. Pinterest uses it for deciding what to display on a web page when you go there. And they have um, embedding matrices of products um, in uh, Instacart's uh, case of stores uh, that get shared in the organization so people don't have to train new ones. So for the embedding size, um why wouldn't you just use like the one hot scheme and just um, what what is the advantage of doing this as opposed to just doing a one? Yeah, good question. Scheme? So so we could easily, uh, as you point out, have um, instead of passing in these uh, four numbers, 
we could instead have passed in seven numbers, um, all zeros, uh, but one of them is a one. And that also is a list of floats, and uh, that would totally work. Um, and that's how, generally speaking, categorical variables have been used in statistics for many years. It's called dummy variable <coughs> coding. Um, the problem is that in that case, um, the concept of Sunday could only ever be associated with a single floating point number, right? And so it basically gets this kind of linear behavior. It says like Sunday is more or less of a single thing. Yeah, well, it's not just interactions. It's saying like now Sunday is a concept in four-dimensional space, right? And so what we tend to find happen is that these embedding vectors tend to get these kind of rich semantic concepts. So for example, um, if it turns out that um, weekends uh, kind of have a different behavior, you'll tend to see that Saturday and Sunday will have like some particular number higher. Or more likely, it turns out that certain days of the week are associated with higher sales of um, um, certain kinds of goods that you kind of can't go without. I don't know, like gas or milk, say. Um, or else there might be other products like um, like wine, for example. Like wine that tend to be associated with like the days before weekends or holidays, right? So there might be kind of a column which is like um, uh, to what extent is this day of the week kind of uh, associated with people going out, you know? Uh, so basically, yeah, by by having this higher dimensionality vector rather than just a single number, it gives the deep learning network a chance to learn these rich representations. And so this idea of an embedding is actually what's called a distributed representation. It's kind of the fun, most fundamental concept of neural networks. It's this idea that a concept in a neural network has a kind of a, a high dimensional representation. Uh, and often it can be hard to interpret because the idea is like each of these numbers in this vector doesn't even have to have just one meaning. You know, it could mean one thing if this is low and that one's high, and something else if that one's high and that one's low, because it's going through this kind of rich nonlinear function, right? And so it's, it's this um, it's this rich representation that allows it to learn um, such a, such such interesting uh, uh, relationships. I'm kind of uh, oh, got another question. Sure, All right. I'll speak louder. Uh, so, uh, are there? Uh is an embedding so I, I get the, the the fundamental of the like the word vector word to vec vector algebra you can run on this thing. Uh -huh. but it, are the embeddings suited suitable for certain types of variables like uh, or are these only suitable for I mean are there different categories that that the embeddings are suitable for an embedding is suitable for any categorical variable okay so so the only thing it it, it can't really work well at all for would be something that is too high cardinality. So like in other words, we had like whatever it was, 600,000 rows. If you had a variable with 600,000 levels, that's just not a useful categorical variable. Uh, you could bucketize it, I guess. Um, but yeah, in general, like you can see here, the, 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 the third place getters in this competition um, really decided that everything that was not too high cardinality, they put them all as categorical variables. And I think that's a good rule of thumb. You know, if you, if you can make it a categorical variable, you may as well, because that way it can learn this rich distributed representation, whereas if you leave it as continuous, you know, the most it can do is to kind of try and find a, a, you know, a single functional form that fits it well. I have a question. So, um, you were saying that uh, you are kind of increasing the dimension, but mm. actually in in most cases we will use a one hole encoding which has even a bigger dimension. That so so in in a way you are also re reducing, but in the most rich. Uh, way. I think that's 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 fair, Yannet. Yeah, yeah. It, it like yes, you know, you can because think of it as a one hole encoding, I'm, which actually is high dimensional, but it's not 
mm. meaningfully higher dimensional because yeah. everything except one is a zero. I, I'm saying that also because even this will reduce the amount of memory and things like this that you have to. Right. In practical terms, this is better. You're, also. you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And and so uh, we may as well go ahead and actually describe like what's going on with the matrix algebra behind the scenes. See, this, if this doesn't quite make sense, you can kind of skip over it. But for some people, I know this really helps. Um, if we started out with something saying this is Sunday, right? Um, we could represent this as a one hot encoded vector, right? And so Sunday, you know, maybe was position here, so that would be a one, and then the rest are zeros. Okay, and then we've got our embedding matrix, right, with eight rows, and in this case, four columns. Um, one way to think of this actually is a matrix product, right? So I said you could think of this as like looking up the number one, you know, and finding like its index in the array. But if you think about it, that's actually identical to doing a matrix product between a one hot encoded vector and the embedding matrix. Like you're going to go zero times this row, one times this row, zero times this row. And so it's like a one hot embedding matrix product is identical to doing the lookup. And so um, some people in the bad old days actually implemented embedding matrices by doing a one hot encoding and then a matrix product. Um, and in fact, a lot of like machine learning methods still kind of do that. Um, but as Yannette was kind of alluding to, it's that's terribly inefficient. So all of the modern libraries implement this as take an, take an integer and do a lookup into an array. But the, the nice thing about realizing that it's actually a matrix product mathematically is it makes it more obvious how the gradients are going to flow. So when we do stochastic gradient descent, it's we can think of it as just another linear layer. Okay. So as I say, that's like a, a somewhat minor detail, but hopefully for some of you it helps. Uh, can you touch on using dates and times as categoricals and how that affects uh, seasonality? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Did I cover dates at all last week? I don't remember. No. Great. Um, so I covered dates in a lot of detail in the machine learning course, but it's worth um, briefly mentioning here. Um, um, there's a fast AI um, function called add date part, uh, uh, which takes a data frame and a column name. Uh, that column name needs to be a date. It removes, uh, unless you've got drop equals false, uh, it optionally removes the column from the data frame and replaces it with lots of columns representing all of the useful information about that date, like day of week, day of month, month of year, year, is it the start of a quarter, is it the end of a quarter, basically everything that pandas gives us. Um, and so that way we end up, um, when we look at our uh, list of features, well you can see them here, right? Year, month, week, day, day of week, etc. So these all get created for us by add date part. Um, so we end up with, uh, you know, this uh, uh, eight long embedding matrix. Uh, so eight, I guess eight rows by four column embedding matrix for day of week. And conceptually, that allows us or allows our model to create some pretty interesting time series models, right? Like it, it can, if there's something that has a seven day period cycle. Uh, that kind of goes up on Mondays and down on Wednesdays, but only for dairy and only in Berlin, it can totally do that. But right? it has all the information it needs uh, to do that. Uh, so this turns out to be a really fantastic way to deal with time series. So I'm really glad you, you asked the question. You just need to make sure that that the, the cycle indicator in your time series exists as a column. So if you didn't have a column there called day of week, it would be very, very difficult for the neural network to somehow learn to do like a divide mod 7 and then somehow look that up in an embedding matrix. Like it, not impossible, but really hard, it would use lots of computation, wouldn't do it very well. So an example of the kind of thing that you need to think about might be um, uh, holidays. 
for example, you know, or if you were doing something in, in you know, of sales of um, beverages in San Francisco, uh, you probably would want a list of like when when are the when is the ball game on at AT and T Park, right? Because that's going to impact how many people that are drinking beer in Soma, right? So you need to make sure that the kind of the basic indicators or or periodicities or whatever are there in your data, and as long as they are, the neural net's going to learn to use them. So uh, I'm kind of trying to skip over some of the non deep learning parts. Um, all right, so um, the key thing here is that we've got our model data that came from the data frame. Uh, we tell it how big to make the embedding matrices. Um, we also have to tell it of the uh, columns in that data frame um, how many of those are categorical variables or how many of them are continuous variables. So the actual parameter is number of continuous variables. So you can here you can see we just pass in how many columns are there minus how many categorical variables are there. So then that way the um, the neural net knows how to create something that puts the continuous variables over here and the categorical variables over there. Um, the embedding matrix has its own dropout, right? So this is the dropout that's applied to the embedding matrix. This is the number of activations in the first linear layer, the number of activations in the second linear layer, the dropout in the first linear layer, the dropout for the second linear layer. Uh, this bit we won't worry about for now. And then finally is how many outputs do we want to create? Okay, so this is the output of the last linear layer, and obviously it's one because we want to predict a single number, which is sales. Okay, so uh, after that we now have a learner where we can call LR find and we get the standard looking shape and we can say what amount do we want to use and we can then go ahead and start training using exactly the same API we've seen before. Uh, so this is all identical. Um, you can pass in, I'm not sure if you've seen this before, custom metrics. What this does is it just says, please print out a number at the end of every epoch by calling this function. Right? And this is a function we defined a little bit earlier, which was the uh, root mean squared percentage error, first of all going e to the power of our sales because our sales were originally logged. Um, so this doesn't tra change the training at all. It just It's just something to print out. So we train that for a while, um, and you know we've got some benefits that the original people that um, built this don't have. Specifically, we've got things like um, cyclical, uh, not cyclical learning rates, stochastic gradient descent with restarts. And so it's actually interesting to have a look and compare um, uh, although our validation set isn't identical to the test set, it's very similar. It's a two-week period that is at the end of the training data, um, so our numbers should be similar. And if we look at what we get, 0.097, and compare that to the leaderboard, public leaderboard, um, you can see we're kind of Let's have a look. In the top, actually, that's interesting. There's a big difference between the public and private leaderboard. It would have it would have been right at the top of the private leaderboard, but only in the top thirty or forty on the public leaderboard. So not quite sure, but you can see like we're certainly in the top end of this competition. Um, I actually tried running the third place getters code and their final result was over 0.1, so I, I actually think that we're should be compared to the private leaderboard, but I'm not sure. Uh, so anyway, so you can see there basically there's a, a technique for dealing with time series and uh, structured data, and you know interestingly the group that that used this technique they actually wrote a paper about it that's linked in this notebook. Um, when you compare it to the folks that won this competition um, and came second, uh, they did. The other folks did way more feature engineering. Like the winners uh, of this competition were actually subject matter experts in logistics um, sales forecasting, and so they had their own like code to create lots and lots of features. Um, and talking to the folks at Pinterest 
who built their very similar model for recommendations for Pinterest, they said the same thing, which is that when they switched from gradient boosting machines to deep learning, they did like way, way, way less uh, feature engineering. It was a much, much simpler model and requires much less maintenance. Um, and so this is like one of the big benefits of using this approach to deep learning. You can get state-of-the-art results, um, but with a lot less work. Uh, yes. Are we using any uh, time series in any of these uh, fits? Uh, indirectly, uh, absolutely. Using what we just saw, we have a day of week, month of year, all that stuff, uh, columns. Uh, and most of them are being treated as categories. So we're building a distributed representation of January, we're building a distributed representation of Sunday, we're building a distributed representation of Christmas. So we're not using any classic time series techniques, all we're doing is two fully connected layers in a neural net. So through the embedded uh, matrix, uh, that's what uh... Exactly, exactly, yeah. So the embedding matrix is able to deal with this stuff like day of week periodicity and so forth in a way richer way than any standard time series technique I've ever come across. And one last question. Yeah. Uh, the matrix uh, in the earlier models uh, when we did the CNN, uh, we did not pass it during the fit. We passed it when the data was, uh, when we got the data. So we're not passing anything to fit, just the learning rate and the number of cycles. Uh, in this case, we're passing in metrics because we want to print out some extra stuff. Um, there is a difference in that uh, we're calling data.getLearner. So with um, uh, the imaging approach, um, we just go learner.trained and pass it the data. Um, but in for these kinds of models, in fact for a lot of the models, the model that we build depends on the data. In this case we actually need to know like what embedding matrices do we have uh, and stuff like that. So in this case the, it's actually the data object that creates the learner. So yeah, it is, it is a bit upside down to what we've seen before. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so just to summarize, or maybe I'm confused. Um, so, in this case, what we are doing is like we have some kind of structure data, mm. we did feature engineering, mm. we got some columnar database mm. or something similar. Uh, apparent then, is data frame. Yep. Yeah, data frame and then we are mapping it to deep learning mm -hmm. by using this in, in, in embedding, matrix. embedding matrix for the categorical variables, for, uh, so, so for the continuous we just put them straight in. So, so all I need to do is like if I have a if I have already have a feature engineering model, yeah. then to map it to deep learning, I just have to figure out which one I can move into categorical and then yeah. make it learn by itself. Yeah, great question. So yes, exactly. If you want to use this on your own data set, step one is list the categorical variable names, list the continuous variable names. Um, Put it in a data frame, a pandas data frame. Um, step two is to uh, create a list of which row indexes do you want in your validation set. Um, step three uh, is to call this line of code uh, using this exact, like these exact, you can just copy and paste it. Uh, step four is to create your list of how big you want each embedding matrix to be. And then step five is to call get learner. Uh, you can use these exact parameters to start with, um, and if it overfits or underfits, you can fiddle with them. And then the final step is to call uh, fit. So yeah, almost all of this code will be nearly identical. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is um, how is data augmentation? can be used in this case, and the second one is, um, what, is what are dropouts doing in here? Okay, so data augmentation, I have no idea. I mean, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it's got to be domain specific. I've never seen any paper or anybody in industry doing data augmentation with structured data and deep learning. So 
I don't. I think it can be done. I just haven't seen it done. What is dropout doing? Um, exactly the same as before. So uh, at each point, um, we have um, uh, the output of each of these linear layers is just a rank one tensor, and so dropout is going to go ahead and say, let's throw away half of the activations. Um, and the very first dropout, embedding dropout, literally goes through the embedding matrix and says, let's throw away half the activations. That's it. Okay, let's take a break and let's come back at uh, five past eight. Okay, thanks everybody. So now we're going to move into something um, equally exciting. Um, actually, before I do, I just mentioned that I had a good question uh, during the break, which was, what's the downside? Like, like no, almost no one's using this. Um, why not? Um, and and basically, I think the answer is like as we discussed before. No one in academia almost is working on this because it's not something that people really publish on, um, um, and as a result there haven't been really great examples where people could look at and say, oh, here's a technique that works well, so let's have our company implement it. Um, but perhaps equally importantly, um, until now with this fast AI library, there hasn't been any way to, to do it conveniently. If you wanted to implement one of these models, you had to write all the custom code yourself, uh, or else now, as we discussed, it's you know, six. Um, it's basically a six-step process, you know, involving about you know not much more than six lines of code. Uh, so uh, the reason I mentioned this is to say, like, I think there are a lot of big commercial and scientific opportunities to use this to solve problems that previously haven't been solved. Very well before. Um, so, like, I'll be really interested to hear if some of you try this out. You know, maybe on like old Kaggle competitions, you might find like, oh, I would have won this if I'd used this technique. That would be interesting. Or if you've got some data set you work with at work, you know, some kind of predictive model that you've been doing with a GBM or a random forest. Does this help? Um, I, you know. The thing I, I'm I'm still somewhat new to this. Um, I've been doing this for basically since the start of the year was when I started working on these structured deep learning models. Uh, so I haven't had enough opportunity to know where might it fail. Um, it's worked for nearly everything I've tried it with so far. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this, this class is the first time that there's going to be like more than half a dozen people <laughs> in the world who actually are working on this. So I think, you know, as a group, we're going to hopefully learn a lot and, and build some interesting things. And this would be a great thing if you're thinking of writing a post about something, or well, here's, here's an area that uh, there's a couple of, like, there's a post from Instacart about what they did. Um, Pinterest has a uh, an O'Reilly AI video about what they did. That's about it. And there's two academic papers, uh, both about Kaggle competition victories. Uh, one from uh, Yoshi, Yoshio Bengio and his group, uh, they won a taxi um, destination forecasting competition, and then also the one linked uh, for this Rossman competition. So um, yeah, there's some background on that. All right, so language, um, natural language processing, um, is the area which is kind of like the most up-and-coming area of deep learning. It's kind of like two or three years behind um, computer vision in deep learning. It was kind of like the the second area that deep learning started getting really popular in, and you know, computer vision got to the point where it was like the clear state of the art for most computer vision things, maybe in like 2014, you know, and in some things in like 2012. Um, in NLP. We're still at the point where, um, for a lot of things, deep learning is now the state of the art, but not quite everything. Uh, but as you'll see, the state of kind of the software and some of the concepts is much less mature than it is 
for computer vision. Uh, so in general, none of the stuff we talk about after computer vision is going to be as like settled as the computer vision stuff was. So NLP, one of the interesting things is in the last few months, some of the good ideas from computer vision have started to spread into NLP for the first time, and we've seen some really big advances. So a lot of the stuff you'll see in NLP is is pretty new. Um, so I'm going to start with a particular um, kind of NLP problem, and one of the things you'll find in NLP is like there are particular problems you can solve, and they have particular names. And so there's a particular kind of problem in NLP called language modeling. And language modeling has a very specific definition. It means build a model where given a few words of a sentence, can you predict what the next word is going to be? So if you're using your mobile phone, and you're typing away, and you press space, and then it says like this is what the next word might be, like SwiftKey does this like really well. And SwiftKey actually uses deep learning for this. Um, that's that's a language model. Okay, so it has a very specific meaning. When we say language modeling, we mean a model that can predict the next word of a sentence. So let me give you an example. I downloaded about 18 months worth of um, papers from Archive. So for those of you that don't know it, Archive is uh, the most popular preprint server in this community and various others. Um, and has you know lots of academic papers, and so uh, I grabbed uh, the uh, abstracts and the topics for each. And so here's an example. So the category of this particular paper was uh, CSNI is computer science and networking, and then the summary, so like the abstract of the paper, was saying the exploitation of MM wave bands is one of the key enabler for 5G mobile. Blah blah blah. Okay, so here's like an example. A piece of text from my language model. So I trained a language model on this uh, archive data set that I downloaded, and then I built a simple little test, which basically uh, you would pass it some like priming text. So you'd say like, oh, imagine you started reading a document that said category is computer science and networking, and the summary is algorithms that, and then I said please write. Uh, an archive abstract. So it said that if it's a uh, networking Algorithms that use the same network as a single node are not able to achieve the same performance as a traditional network based routing algorithms In this paper we propose a novel routing scheme blah blah blah. Okay, so it it's learnt by reading archive papers that somebody who is saying algorithms that where the word cat CSNI came before it is going to talk like this and remember It started out not knowing English at all, right? It actually started out with an embedding matrix for every word in English that was random. Okay, and by reading lots of archive papers, it learnt what kind of words followed others. So then I tried, what if we said cat, computer science, computer vision, summary, algorithms that use the same data to perform image classification are increasingly being used to improve the performance of image classification algorithms. In this paper we propose a novel method for image classification using a deep convolutional neural network parentheses, CNN. So you can see like it's kind of like almost the same sentence as back here, but things are just changed into this world of computer vision rather than networking. So I tried something else which is like okay, category, computer vision, and then I created the world's shortest ever abstract algorithms. And then I said title on, and the title of this is going to be on the performance of deep learning for image classification. EOS is end of string, so that's like end of title. What if it was networking summary algorithms title on the performance of wireless networks, as opposed to towards computer vision, towards a new approach to image classification, networking towards a new approach to the analysis of wireless networks. So like, I find this mind-blowing, right? I started out with some random matrices, which are like literally no, no pre-trained anything. I fed it 18 months worth of archive articles, and it learnt not only how to write English pretty well, but also that after you say something's a convolutional neural network, you should then use parentheses to say what it's called. And furthermore, 
that the kinds of things people talk and say create algorithms for in computer vision are performing image classification and in networking are um, achieving the same performance as traditional network-based routing algorithms. So, like a language model is can be like incredibly deep and subtle, right? And so we're going to try and build that. But actually, not because we care about this at all. Um, we're going to build it because we're going to try and create a pre-trained model. What we're actually going to try and do is take um, IMDb movie reviews and figure out whether they're positive or negative. Right? So if you think about it, this is a lot like cats versus dogs. It's a classification algorithm. But rather than an image, we're going to have the text of a review. So I'd really like to use a pre-trained network. Like I would at least like a net to start with a network that knows how to read English, right? And so um, my view was like, okay, that to know how to read English means you should be able to like predict the next word of a sentence. So what if we pre-train a language model, and then use that pre-trained language model, and then just like in computer vision, stick some new layers on the end and ask it instead of to predicting the next word in a sentence. Instead, predict whether something is positive or negative. So, when I started working on this, this was actually a new idea. Um, unfortunately, in the last couple of months, I've been doing it. You know, a few people have actually, a couple of people have started publishing this, and so this has moved from being a totally new idea to being a, you know, somewhat new idea. Uh, so, um, so this idea of uh, creating a language model. Making that the pre-trained model for a classification model is what we're going to learn to do now. And so the idea is we're really kind of trying to leverage exactly what we learned in our computer vision work, which is how do we do fine-tuning to create powerful classification models? Yes, you know. So why don't you think um, that doing just directly what you want to do um, doesn't work better? Um, well, uh, A, because it doesn't. Um, it just turns out it doesn't uh, empirically, um, and the reason it doesn't is uh, a number of things. Um, first of all, uh, as we know, fine-tuning a pre-trained network is really powerful, right? So if we can get it to learn some related task first, then we can use all that information to try and help it on the second task. Um, the other reason is <coughs> IMDB movie reviews are, you know, up to a thousand words long. They're, they're pretty big. And so <clears throat> after reading a thousand words, knowing nothing about how English is structured or even what the concept of a word is, or punctuation or whatever, at the end of this thousand integers, you know, they end up being integers, all you get is a one or a zero, positive or negative. And so trying to like learn the entire structure of English and then how it expresses positive and negative sentiments from a single number is just too much to expect. So by building a language model first, we can try to build a neural network that kind of understands the English of movie reviews. And then we hope that some of the things it's learnt about uh, are going to be useful in deciding whether something's a positive or a negative movie review. That's a great question. Can you pass that? Thanks. Uh, is this similar to the CAR RNN uh, by Carpathy? Yeah, this is somewhat similar to CAR RNN by Carpathy. So uh, the famous uh, CAR, as in C H A R RNN, um, uh, try to predict the next letter yeah. given a number of previous letters. Um, language models generally work at a word level; they don't have to. Um, and doing things at a word level turns out to be uh, can be quite a bit more powerful. Uh, and we're going to focus on word level modeling in this course. And, and then to what extent are, are these generated words uh, actual copies of what it found in the in the training data set, or are these completely uh, random things that it actually learned? And how, how do we know how to distinguish between those two? Yeah, I mean these are all good questions. Uh, the the words are definitely words we've seen before. The word because it's not at a character level, so it can only give us the word it's seen before. The sentences, um, there's a number of kind of rigorous ways of doing it, but I think the easiest is to get a sense of like, well, here are two like different categories where it's kind of created very similar concepts, but 
mixing them up in just the right way. Like it, it would be very hard to to do what we've seen here just by like spitting back things it's seen before. Um, but you could of course actually go back and, and check, you know, have you seen that sentence before? Or like a string distance, have you seen a similar sentence before? Um, in this case, um, uh, oh, and of course another way to do it is the length, most importantly, when we train the language model, as we'll see, we'll have a validation set. And so we're trying to predict the next word um, of something it's never seen before, and so if it's good at doing that, uh, it should be good at generating text. Um, in this case, the purpose the purpose is not to generate text. That was just a fun example, and so I'm not really going to study that too much. But you know, you during the week totally can. Like you can totally build your you know Great American Novel Generator or whatever. Um, there are actually some tricks to to using language models to generate text that I'm not using here. They're pretty simple. We can talk about them on the forum if if you like. Um, but my focus is actually on classification. So I think that's the thing which is uh, uh, incredibly powerful. Uh, like text classification, I don't know, you're a hedge fund, you want to like read every article as soon as it comes out through Reuters or Twitter or whatever and immediately identify things which in the past have caused, you know, massive market drops. That's a classification model. Or you want to uh, recognize um, all of the customer service uh, queries which tend to be associated with people who um, who leave your you know who, who cancel their contracts in the next month that's a classification problem so like it's a really powerful kind of um, thing for um, data journalism activision uh, activism uh, law uh, commerce so forth right like uh, uh, I'm trying to class uh, documents into whether they're part of legal discovery or not part of legal discovery. Um, okay, so you get the idea. So um, in terms of stuff we're importing, we're importing a few new things here. One of the um, bunch of things we're importing is um, Torch Text. Uh, Torch Text is PyTorch's like NLP library. And so fast AI is designed to work hand in hand with torch text as you'll see and then there's a few uh, uh, text specific sub bits of fast fast AI that we'll be using so we're going to be working with the uh, IMDB large movie review data set it's uh, very very well studied in academia um, you know uh, lots and lots of people over the years have studied this data set 50,000 reviews, uh, highly polarized reviews, um, either positive or negative, uh, each one has been um, classified um, by sentiment. Okay, so we're going to try, uh, first of all, however, to create a language model, so we're going to ignore the sentiment entirely. Right? So just like for dogs and cats, pre-train a model to do one thing, and then fine-tune it to do something else. Um, because this kind of idea in NLP is, is so, so, so new, um, there's basically no models you can download for this, so we're going to have to create our own. All right. So um, uh, having downloaded the data, you can use the link here. Um, we do the usual stuff of saying the path to it, training and validation path. Um, and as you can see, it looks pretty pretty traditional compared to Vision. There's a directory of training. There's a directory of test. Uh, we don't actually have separate test and validation in this case. Um, and just like in Envision, the training directory has a bunch of files in it. Um, in this case, not representing images, but representing movie reviews. Uh, so we could cat one of those files, uh, and here we learn about uh, the classic uh, Zombie Geddon movie. I have to say, with a name like uh, Zombie Geddon and an atom bomb on the front cover, I was expecting a flat out chop socky fun coup. <laughs> Uh, rent it if you want to get stoned on a Friday night and laugh with your buddies. Don't rent it if you're an uptight weenie or want a zombie movie with lots of flesh eating. I think I'm going to enjoy zombie getting. So, all right. So we've learned something today. Um, all right. So we can just use standard um, Unix stuff to see like how many words are in the data set. So in the training set, we've got uh, 17 and a half million words. Um, test set, we've got uh, 5.6 million words. Um, so here's uh, 
These are, this is IMDB. So IMDB is uh, yeah, random people. This is not a New York Times listed review as far as I know. Um, uh, it, okay, so before we can um, do anything with text, we have to turn it into a list of tokens. A, a token is basically like a word, right? So we're going to try and turn this eventually into a list of numbers. So the first step is to turn it into a list of words. Um, that's called tokenization in NLP. NLP has a huge lot of jargon that we'll, we'll learn over time. Um, one thing that's a bit uh, tricky though with, when we're doing tokenization is here I've, I've tokenized that review and then joined it back up with spaces, and you'll see here that wasn't has become two tokens, which makes perfect sense, right? Wasn't is two things, right? Um, dot 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 has become one token, right? Where else lots of exclamation marks has become lots of tokens. So like a good tokenizer will do a good job of recognizing like pieces of an English sentence. Each separate piece of punctuation will be separated, um, and each part of a multi-part word will be separated as appropriate. So uh, Spacey is a, I think it's an Australian developed piece of software actually that does lots of uh, NLP stuff. It's got the best tokenizer I know, and so um, Fast AI is designed to work well with the Spacey tokenizer as its torch text. So here's an example of tokenization. All right. So what we do with uh, torch text is we basically have to start out by creating something called a field, and a field is a definition of how to pre-process some text. And so here's an example of the definition of a field. It says, I want to lowercase the text, and I want to tokenize it with the function called spacey tokenize. Okay, so it hasn't done anything yet, we're just telling it when we do do something, this is what to do. And so that we're going to store that description of what to do in a thing called capital text. Um, and so this is this is none of this is this is not fast AI specific at all. This is part of Torch Text. You can go to the Torch Text website, read the docs. There's not lots of docs yet. This is all very very new. Um, so probably the best information you'll find about it is in this lesson. Um, but there's some more information um, on this site. All right. So what we can now do is go ahead and create uh, the usual fast AI model data object, okay? Um, and so to create the model data object, we have to provide a few bits of information. We have to say what's the training set, uh, so the path to the, the text files, the validation set, and the test set. Um, in this case, just to keep things simple, I don't have a separate validation and test set, so I'm going to pass in the validation set for both of those two things. All right, so now we can create our model data object. As per usual, the first thing we give it is the path. Um, the second thing we give it is the torch text field definition of how to pre-process that text. <coughs> the third thing we give it is the dictionary or the list of uh, all of the files we have, train validation test. Um, as per usual, we can pass in a batch size. And then we've got a special special couple of extra things here. One is a very commonly used in NLP, minimum frequency. What this says is, in a moment, we're going to be replacing every one of these words with an integer, which basically will be a unique index for every word. And this basically says if there are any words that occur less than ten times, just call it unknown. Right? Don't think of it as a word. Right? We'll see that in de more detail in a moment. And then we're going to see this in more detail as well. BPTT stands for backprop through time. And this is where we define how long a sentence will we um, stick on the GPU at once. So we're going to break them up, and in this case we're going to break them up into sentences of tw uh, 70 tokens uh, or less on the whole. So we're going to see all this in a moment. All right. So after building our model data object, right, what it actually does is it's going to fill this text field with uh, an additional attribute called vocab. And this is a really important NLP concept. I'm sorry, there's so many NLP concepts we just have to throw at you kind of quickly, but we'll see them a few times. Right? A vo vocab is the vocabulary. And the vocabulary in NLP has a very specific meaning. It is, what is the list of unique words that appeared in this text? So every one of them is going to get a unique index. So let's take a look, right? 
Here is text.vocab.its. This stands for, this is all torch text, not fast AI. Uh, text.vocab.int to string maps the integer 0 to unknown, the integer 1 to padding, the integer 2 to the, then comma, dot, and, a, uh, of, to, and so forth. Right? So this is the first 12 uh, elements of the array um, uh, of the vocab from the IMDB movie review. And it's been sorted by frequency, um, except for the first two special ones. So for example, we can then go backwards, s to i, string to int. Here is the, it's in position 0, 1, 2, so string to int the is 2. So the vocab lets us take a word and map it to an integer, or take an integer and map it to a word. Right? And so that means that we can then take uh, the first 12 tokens, for example, of our text and turn them into uh, 12 ints. So for example, here is of the, here you can see 7, 2, and here you can see 7, 2. Right? So we're going to be working uh, in this form. Did you have a question? Yeah, could you pass that back there, Yana? Is it uh, common to do any stemming or lemmatizing? Um, not really, no. Um, generally, tokenization is, is what we want. Like with a language model, we, you know, to keep it as general as possible, we want to know what's coming next. And so, like, whether it's future tense or past tense or plural or singular, like, we don't really know which things are going to be interesting and which aren't. Um, so, um, it, it seems that it's, it's generally best to kind of leave it alone as much as possible. Um, be the short answer. You know, having said that, as I say, this is all pretty new. So if there are some particular areas that some researcher maybe has already discovered that some other kinds of pre-processing are helpful, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised not to know about it. So when you're dealing with, um, uh, you know, natural language, isn't context important? Context is very important. So if, if you're if you're using your uh, the species tokenizer and literally just looking at individual words, no, no, we're not text. looking at words. This is this look. This is I just don't get some of the big premises of this. Like they're they're in order. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just because we replaced I with the number twelve, these are still in that order. Yeah. There is a different way of dealing with natural language called a um, bag of words. And bag of words, you do throw away the order and the context. And in the machine learning course, we'll be learning about working with bag of words representations. Um, but my belief is that they are no longer useful, or on the verge of becoming no longer useful. We're starting to learn how to use deep learning to use context properly now. Um, but it's kind of for the first time. It's really like only in the last few months. All right. So I mentioned that we've got two numbers, batch size and BPTT, backprop through time. So this is kind of subtle. Um, so we've got some um, big long piece of text. Okay, so we've got some big long piece of text, you know, here's our sentence, it's a bunch of words, right? And actually what happens in a language model is even though we have lots of movie reviews, they actually all get concatenated together into one big block of text, right? So it's basically predict the next word um, in this huge long thing, which is all of the IMDb movie reviews concatenated together. So this thing is, you know, uh, what did we say it was? Like tens of millions of words long. And so what we do is we split it up into batches first, right? So these like are our splits into batches. Right? And so if we said um, we want a batch size of um, 64, we actually break the, whatever it was, 60 million words into just 64 sections. Right? And then we take each one of the 64 sections and we move it like underneath the previous one. I didn't do a great job of that. But right? Like move it underneath. So we end up with a matrix which is <coughs> 
64, uh, actually I think we move them across wise, so it's actually, I think, just transpose it. We end up with a matrix that's like 64 columns wide, and the length, let's say the original was 64 million, right, then the length is like 10 million long, right? So each of these represents one sixty-fourth of our entire IMDB review set. Right? And so that's our starting point. So then what we do is we then grab a little chunk of this at a time, and those chunk lengths are approximately equal to BPTT, which I think we had equal to 70. So we basically grab a little 70 long section, and that's the first thing we chuck into our GPU. That's a batch, right? So a batch is always of length of width 64 or batch size, and each bit is a sequence of length up to 70. So let me show you. Right? So here, if I go um, take my train data loader, I don't know if you folks have tried playing with this yet, but you can take any data loader, wrap it with iter to turn it into an iterator, and then call next on it to grab a, a batch of data, just as if you were a neural net. You get exactly what the neural net gets. And you can see here, we get back a 75 by 64 tensor, right? So it's 64 wide, right? And I said it's approximately 70 high, and but not exactly. Um, and that's actually kind of interesting. Uh, a really neat trick that Torch Text does is they randomly change the back prop through time number every time. So each epoch, it's getting slightly different bits of text. This is kind of like in computer vision, we randomly shuffle the images. We can't randomly shuffle the words, right, because we need them to be in the right order, so instead we randomly move their breakpoints a little bit. Okay, so this is the equivalent. So in other words, this um, This here is of length 75, right? There's a there's an ellipsis in the middle, um, and that represents the first 75 words of the first review, right? Whereas this 75 here represents the first 75 words of the of the second of the 64 segments. That's it. Have to go in like 10 million words to find that one, right? And so here's the first 75 words of the last of those 64 segments, okay? And so then what we have down here is the next sequence, right? So 51, there's 51. 615, there's 615. 25, there's 25, right? And in this case, it actually is of the same size, it's also 75 by 64, but for minor technical reasons it's being flattened out into a single vector. But basically, it's exactly the same as this matrix, but it's just moved down by one, because we're trying to predict the next word. Right? So that all happens for us. Right? If we ask for, and this is the fast AI now, if you ask for a language model data object, then it's going to create these batches of uh, batch size width by BPTT height, um, bits of our language corpus, along with the same thing shuffled along by one word. right? And so we're always going to try and predict the next word. So why don't you, instead of just arbitrarily choosing 64, uh, why don't you choose like, like 64 is a large number, maybe like do it by sentences and make it a large number and then pad it with zero or something. Uh, if you, you know, so that you actually have a one full sentence per line, basically, wouldn't that make more sense? Not really, because remember we're using columns, right? So each of our columns is of length about 10 million, right? So although it's true that those columns aren't always exactly finishing on a full stop, they're so damn long. We don't care because they're like ten million long. 
right? And we're trying to also... So, so each, each line contains each, multiple sentences. Each column contains multiple column. sentences. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's of length about 10 million, and it contains many, 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 many sentences. Because remember, the first thing we did was to take the whole thing and split it into 64 groups. Okay, great. So um, I found this, uh, you know, pertaining to this question, this thing about like what's in this language model matrix, a little mind bending for quite a while. So don't worry if it takes a while and you have to ask a thousand questions on the forum. That's fine, right? Um, but go back and listen to what I just said in this lecture again, go back to that bit where I showed you splitting it up to 64 and moving them around, and try it with some sentences in Excel or something, and see if you can do a better job of explaining it than I did. Because <laughs> uh, this is like how Torch text works, um, and then what FastAI adds on is this idea of like kind of how to build a, uh, a language model out of it. Although actually a lot of that's stolen from Torch Text as well. Like there's sometimes where Torch Text starts and Fast AI ends is, or vice versa, is a little subtle. They really work closely together. Okay, so um, now that we have a model data object um, that can feed us batches, um, we can go ahead and create a model, right? And so in this case, um, we're going to create an embedding matrix. And our vocab, um, we can see how big our vocab was. Let's have a look back here. So we can see here um, in the model data object there are 4,602 um, um, kind of pieces that we're going to go through. That's basically equal to the number of um, the total length of everything divided by batch size times BPTT. And um, this one I wanted to show you NT. I've got the definition up here, number of unique tokens, NT is the number of tokens, that's the size of our vocab. So we've got 34,945 unique words, uh, and notice the unique words that had to appear at least 10 times, okay, because otherwise they've been replaced with unk. Right. Um, the length of the data set is one, because as far as a language model is concerned, there's only one thing, which is the whole corpus, right? And then that thing has, oh, here it is, 20.6 million words in it, right? So those um, 34,945 things are used to create an embedding matrix of number of rows is equal to 34, 9, 4, 5, right? And so the first one represents unk, the second one represents pad, the third one was dot, the fourth one was comma, the fifth one, I'm just guessing, was the, and so forth. right? And so each one of these gets an embedding vector. So this is literally identical to what we did before the break. right? This is a categorical variable. It's just a very high cardinality categorical variable. And furthermore, it's the only variable, right? And this is pretty standard in NLP. You have a variable, which is a word, right? You have a single categorical variable, single column, basically, and it's, it's of 34,945 cardinality categorical variable, and so we're going to create an embedding matrix for it. So M size is the size of the embedding vector, 200. Okay. So that's going to be length 200. A lot bigger than our previous embedding vectors, not surprising because a word has a lot more nuance to it than the concept of Sunday, right? Uh, or Rossman's Berlin store, or whatever, right? So it's generally an embedding size for a word will be somewhere between about 50 and about 600. Okay, so I've kind of gone somewhere in the middle. Um, we then have to say, as per usual, how many activations do you want in your layers? So we're going to use 500, and then how many layers do you want in your neural net? We're going to use uh, three. Okay. Um, this is a minor technical detail. It turns out that um, we're going to learn later about the Atom Optimizer, um, that basically the defaults for it don't work very well with these kinds of models, so we just have to change some of these. You, you know, basically any time you're doing NLP, you should probably 
include this line because uh, it, it works pretty well. Um, so having done that, we can now again take our model data object and grab a model out of it, and we can pass in a few different things. What optimization function do we want? How big an embedding do we want? How many hidden how many activations? Number of hidden? How many layers? And how much dropout of many different kinds? Uh, so this language model we're going to use is a very recent development uh, called uh, AWD LSTM uh, by Stephen Merity, who's an NLP researcher uh, based in San Francisco, and his main contribution really was to show like how to put dropout all over the place in, in these NLP models. Um, so we're not going to worry now, we'll do this in the last lecture, is worrying about like what all the, like what is the architecture and what are all these dropouts. For now, just know it's the same as per usual. If you try to build an NLP model and you're underfitting, then decrease all of these dropouts. If you're overfitting, then increase all of these dropouts. In roughly this ratio. Okay? That's that's my rule of thumb. Um, and it, it, again, this is such a recent paper, uh, nobody else is working on this model anyway, so there's not a lot of guidance, but I've found this, these ratios work well, that's what Stephen's been using as well. Um, there's another kind of uh, way we can avoid overfitting that we'll talk about in the last class. Again, for now, this one actually works totally reliably, so all of your NLP models probably want this particular line of code. Um, and then this one we're going to talk about at the end, uh, last lecture as well. Um, you can always include this. Basically, what it says is um, um, when you do um, when you look at your gradients and you multiply them by the learning rate and you decide how much to update your weights by, um, this says clip them, like literally, like so, like don't let them be more than 0 0.3. Um, and this is quite a Cool little trick, right? Because like, um, if your learning rate's pretty high, and you kind of don't want to get in that situation we talked about, where you kind of got this kind of thing, where you go, um, you know, rather than little step, little step, little step, instead you go like, oh, too big, oh, too big, right? With gradient clipping, it kind of goes this far, and it's like, oh my goodness, I'm going too far, I'll stop. Right, that's basically what gradient clipping does. Um, so um, anyway, so these are a bunch of parameters. The details don't matter too much right now. You can just steal these, um, uh, and then we can go ahead and call fit with exactly the same parameters as usual. Uh, so uh, Jeremy, um, there are all these uh, other. Um, Word embedding things like like um, word to vec and glove. Wow. Yeah. So I have two questions about that. One is um, how are those different from these? And the second question: Why don't you initialize them with one of those? Yeah. So um, so basically, that's a great question. So basically, um, people have pre-trained these embedding matrices before to do various other tasks. They're not whole pre-trained models, they're just a pre-trained embedding matrix, and you can download them, uh, and as Yannette says, they have names like word to vec and love, and they're literally just a matrix. Um, there's no reason we couldn't download them. Um, really it's just like, kind of, uh, I found that uh, building a whole pre-trained model in this way didn't seem to benefit much, if at all, from using pre-trained word vectors, where else using a whole pre-trained language model um, made a much bigger difference. So like you remember what a big, um, those of you who saw word to vec it made a big splash when it came out. Uh, I, I, in, I'm finding this technique of pre-trained language models seems much more powerful, basically. But I, I think we could combine both to make them a little better still. When you have a question. What is, what is the model that you have used? Like, how can I know the architecture of the model? So we'll be learning about the model architecture in the last lesson. Um, for now, um, it's a recurrent neural network um, using uh, something called an LSTM, long short-term memory. Um, okay. Um, so, so yeah, lots of details that we're skipping over, but you know, you can do all this without any of those details. 
Um, we go ahead and fit the model. Um, I found that this language model took quite a while to fit, so I kind of like ran it for a while, noticed it was still underfitting, saved where it was up to, ran it a bit more with longer cycle length, saved it again, it still uh, was kind of underfitting, you know, run it again, and kind of finally got to the point where it's like, uh, kind of honestly, I kind of ran out of patience, um, so I just like saved it at that point. Um, and I did the same kind of test that we looked at before, so I was like, oh, it wasn't quite what I was expecting, but I really liked it anyway, the best, and then I was like, okay, let's see how that goes, the best performance was one of the movie where it was a little bit older. I was like, okay, it looks like the language model's working pretty well. Um, so I've pre-trained the language model, um, and so now I want to use it, uh, fine-tune it to do classification, sentiment classification. Now, obviously, if I'm going to use a pre-trained model, I need to use exactly the same vocab, right? The, the word the still needs to map to the number two so that I can look up the vector for the, right? So that's why I first of all load back up my my field object, the thing with the vocab in, right? Now, in this case, if I run it straight afterwards, this is unnecessary, it's already in memory, but this means I can come back to this later. Right um, in a new session, basically. Um, um, I can then go ahead and say, okay, I've now got one more field. Right, in addition to my uh, field, which represents the reviews, I've also got a field which represents the label. Okay, um, and the details aren't too important here. Um, now this time, I need to not treat the whole thing as one big piece of text, but every review is separate. Because each one has a different sentiment attached to it, right? And it so happens that Torch Text already has a data set that does that for IMDb. So I just used IMDb um, built into Torch Text. So basically, once we've done all that, we end up with something where we can like grab for a particular example. We can grab its label, it's positive, and here's some of the text. This is another great Tom Berenger movie. Blah 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 blah. All right. So. Um, this is all not, nothing fast AI specific here. We'll come back to it in the last lecture, um, but Torch Text docs can help understand what's going on. All you need to know is that once you've used this special Torch, torch Text thing called splits to grab a splits object, you can pass it straight into fast AI text data from splits, and that basically converts a Torch Text object into a fast AI object we can train on. So as soon as you've done that. You can just go ahead and say get model, right? And that gets us our learner. Um, and then we can load into it the pre trained model, the language model, right? And so we can now take that pre trained language model and use the stuff that we're kind of familiar with, right? So we can um, make sure that, you know, all except the last layer is frozen, train it a bit, unfreeze it, train it a bit. And the nice thing is, once you've got a pre trained language model, it actually trains super fast. You can see here it's like a couple of minutes per epoch, and it only took me to get my, here's my best one here, it only took me like 10 epochs. So it's like 20 minutes to train this bit. It's really fast. And I ended up with 94.5%. So how good is 94.5%? Well, it so happens that um, uh, actually one of Stephen Meredith's colleagues, James Bradbury, recently created a paper um, um, looking at the state of, like where they tried to create a new state of the art for a bunch of NLP things and one of the things I looked at was um, IMDB and they actually have here a list of the current world's best for uh, IMDB and even with stuff that is highly specialized for sentiment analysis the best anybody had previously come up with was 94.1 so in other words this technique, Getting 94.5 is literally better than anybody has created in the world before, as far as we know, or as far as James Bradbury knows. So, so when I say like there are big opportunities to use this, I mean like this is a technique that nobody else currently has access to, which you know you could like, you know whatever IBM has in Watson or whatever any big company has, you know that they're advertising Unless they have some secret source that they're not publishing which they don't right because people get 
you know, if they have a better thing, they publish it. Um, then you now have access to a better text classification method than has ever existed before. So I really hope that you know you can try this out and, and see how you go. Um, there may be some things it works really well on, and others that it doesn't work as well on. I don't know. Um, I think this kind of sweet spot here that we had about twenty-five thousand, you know, short to medium-sized documents. If you don't have at least that much text, it may be hard to train a decent language model. But having said that, there's a lot more we could do here, right? And we won't be able to do it in part one of this course. We'll do it in part two. But for example, we could start like training language models that look at like, you know, lots and lots of medical journals, and then we could like make a downloadable medical language model that then anybody could use to like fine tune on like. A prostate cancer subset of medical literature, for instance. Like, there's so much we could do. It's kind of exciting. And then, you know, to Yannette's point, we could also combine this with like pre-trained word vectors. So, like, even without trying that hard, like, you know, we even without using like, um, we could have pre-trained a Wikipedia, say, corpus language model, and then fine-tuned it into a IMDB language model, and then fine-tune that into an IBM, IMDB sentiment analysis model, and we would have got something better than this. Um, so, like this, I'm, I really think this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I was talking. There's a, a really fantastic researcher called Sebastian Ruder, who is basically the only NLP researcher I know who's been really, really writing a lot about pre-training and fine-tuning and transfer learning and NLP. And I was asking him, like, why isn't this happening more? And his view was it's because there isn't the software to make it easy, you know. Um, so I'm actually going to share this lecture with with him uh, tomorrow because um, uh, you know uh, it it feels like there's you know hopefully going to be a a lot of stuff coming out now that we're making it really easy to do this. Okay. Um, we're kind of out of time, uh, so what I'll do is I'll quickly look at collaborative filtering introduction, and then we'll finish it next time. But collaborative filtering, there's very, very little new to learn. We've basically learned everything we're going to need. Um, so collaborative filtering, we'll we'll cover this quite quickly next week, and then we're going to do a really deep dive into collaborative filtering next week. Uh, where we're going to learn about, like, we're actually going to from scratch learn how to do um, stochastic gradient descent, um, how to create loss functions, how they work exactly, and then we'll go from there and we'll gradually build back up to really deeply understand um, uh, what's going on in the structured models, and then what's going on in confnets, and then finally what's going on in recurrent neural networks, and hopefully we'll be able to build them all from scratch. Okay, so this is kind of a, going to be really important. This movie lens data set because we're going to use it to learn a lot of like really foundational theory and kind of math behind it. So the movie lens data set, um, this is basically what it looks like. Uh, it contains a bunch of ratings. It says user number one watched movie number thirty-one, and they gave it a rating of two and a half at this particular time. And then they watched movie 1029, and they gave it a rating of three. And they watched rating one, one, movie 1172, and they gave it a rating of four. Okay, and so forth. Right? So this is the ratings table. This is really the only one that matters. And our goal will be for some user we haven't seen before. Sorry, for some user movie combination we haven't seen before, we have to predict if they'll like it. Right, and so this is how recommendation systems are built. This is how like Amazon decides what books to recommend, how Netflix decides what movies to recommend, and so forth. Um, to make it more interesting, we'll also actually download a list of movies. Uh, so each movie, we're actually going to have the title. And so for that question earlier about like what's actually going to be in these embedding matrices, how do we interpret them? We're actually going to be able to look and see um, how that's working. Uh, so basically, this is kind of like. What we're creating is this kind of cross tab of users by movies, right? And so feel free to look ahead during the week. You'll see basically, as per usual, collab filter data set from CSV, model data dot get learner, learn dot fit, and we're done. And you won't be surprised to hear when we then take that and we can to the benchmarks. It seems to be better than the benchmarks we looked at. So that'll basically be it.
and then next week we'll have a deep dive and we'll see how to actually build this from scratch. All right, see you next week. Thank you.